again, students, and we're going to look at chapter 27. This is um, a two-part series, so this is part one of two. Um, as we go through this particular chapter, um, please make sure that your children are not around um, due to the graphic nation, uh, nature of, of the pictures that we are going to be displaying. All right, so all living things, we know that they reproduce, correct? So reproduction, as we know, is a process by which organisms, they make more organisms like themselves. And reproduction is one of the things that are going to set, a, set living things aside or apart from these non-living things. But even though the reproductive system is essential to keeping species alive, unlike other body systems is not essential to keeping an individual alive. So here we're going to be looking at the male reproductive system. Now our genes live on in other offspring. So genes are going to be passed on from your parent to the child and, and so forth and so forth. So this chapter we're going to focus just on the general aspect of human reproductive biology and the role of the, of the male in reproduction. Um, what are we going to look at in this particular um, section of this particular video? Looking at the fundamental biological distinction between male and female, as well as the primary, secondary organs and the secondary sex characteristics. I'm going to we should be able to explain the role of the sex chromosomes in determining a sex. I'll explain how the Y chromosome determines the response of the fetal gono um, gonoid to the prenatal hormones, identify which of the male or female external genitalia are homolo homologous to each other, and of course to de describe the, the descendant, uh, the descent, sorry, of gonoids, and explain why it is very important. All right, so. The essential of sexual reproduction is that it involves two sex, two sexes whose gametes, uh, when combined to form, when combined they form a, a zygote that develops into a new individual. Now the gametes must be mobile so that they can come into contact and must be able to provide nutrients for the zygotes. Now usually these tasks are. Um, Portrayed to two different kinds of two different kinds of gametes: a small mobile one, which would be your sperm, and then a large um, nutrient laden, which would be our eggs. So we're looking at two different types of, of gametes: our eggs carried by the female, and then the sperm that's carried um, by our male. When we look at the terms, gametes basically are sex cells, and they're produced by each parent and our zygote, which are fertilized eggs, and has a combination of both parent genes, I have a combination, sorry, of both parent genes. All right, so, we, so how do we form this zygote? This zygote is basically formed when the male and female sex cells combine with each other. And that's how we form this fertilized egg, also called the zygote. Now, one zygote has mobility, which is the sperm. So basically, it, it, it's able to move around and, and get from place to place very quickly. And that's the sperm cells. Now, the parents, parent producing, um, we know that the male is the one that's going to produce the sperm. And the male is the one that has that Y chromosome. Now, the egg is the one that's going to contain all the nutrients necessary for the, for the, for the egg to be developed for the embryo to be um, to be developed. Um, the female we know carry those eggs and the female is the one that's going to be lacking that Y chromosome. Oops. Okay. So we know that the male there they have an XY and the females let me get this Y looking a little better and the female they have an XX. Okay. Now, in in mammals now, um, 
in mammals, let me see if I can go back, sorry. In mammals, female is the parent that provides a sheltered internal environment and prenatal um, nutrition for the embryo. So we, the male reproductive system it serves to produce the sperm, of course, and then is introduced into the, um, the female body. Now the male, it has a copulatory organ, which is called um, the penis, um, and is therefore introducing these gametes into the female reproductive tract. Now the female reproductive system, we know that it produces these eggs, it's going to receive the sperm, it's going to um, provide um, gametes to be united with each other, is going to harbor or hold that fetus, as well as nourish the, uh, the fetus during the proper development stage. And of course, the female has an, um, a copulatory organ, it's called the vagina, and that's there for receiving the sperm. Let's see if I can clear this off the... Um... Okay. Um, so the reproductive system, it consists of primary and secondary sex organs. The primary sex organ, organs, or the, 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 the gonoids, um, those are there to produce the gametes. And those are like the testes of the, of the male and the ovaries of the female. Now the secondary sex, sex organs are organs other than the gon, um, gonoids that are necessary for reproduction. So in the male, um, they comprise the system of the ducts, glands, and the penis, and um, they're concerned with storage, survival, as well as um, convenient, um, as well as um, a delivery of the sperm. Now in the females, the females, uh, they include the, the uterine tubes, the uterus, the vagina, and those are concerned with uniting the sperm with the egg and, of course, holding or harboring um, the developing fetus. Now, according to location, the reproductive, the reproductive organs are classified as external or internal genitalia. The external genitalia are located in the in the, in the um, um, peri, perineum, and the internal genitalia are, are located mainly in the pelvic in the pelvic cavity, except for the male testes and some associated ducts in the scrotum. Now the secondary the secondary uh, sex Characteristics are features that uh, that future distinguish the sexes, and then they play a role in in attraction between between the two mates. Now, they typically appear typically appear as an animal approaches any type of sexual maturity. Now, in humans, the physical attributes that contribute to mate attraction are culturally contributed to a great degree. Now in both sexes, we have pubic and axillary hair that are that are associated, sorry, and their associated sex glands, and the pitch of the voice. Those are generally accepted as signs of sexual maturity. So when a male's um, voice starts to change and gets a little bit deeper, or they start, or male and female start um, getting um, hair in the pubic region, and of course in the axillary region, axillary talking about underarms, um, those are usually signs of, of puberty. And of course you have in the males that will come up with facial hair, so that's a little coarser, they start getting chest hair, <laughs> and their physique starts to change slightly, become a little bit more muscular. And for females, of course, we're going to have um, fat distributed in different regions. Um, start developing breasts and then um, and basically hair in certain areas as well and then hair not in certain areas such as our face you're not going to get facial hair like, like a, a beard or a mustache okay 
All right, so let's look at this particular syndrome, um, androgen and sensitivity syndrome. This occurs is um, occasionally a girl shows all the usual signs of puberty but fails to menstruate. Now, um, they do have a um, sometimes they have a presence of testes in the uh, in the in the abdomen, and you have a karyotype of a X. Y chromosome. So remember, females are supposed to have an XX chromosome. Now, testes they produce that normal male, um, male levels of, of testosterone. But then we have these target cells that are going to they're going to lack the receptors for these particular hormones. Now, the external genitalia um, develop the female anatomy as if no testosterone were even present. They'll have no uterus as well. They won't have a, uh, a menstrual cycle. So let's look at this chromosomal X determination. Now our cells, they contain, um, they contain 23 pairs of chromosomes, correct? Now here we have 22 pairs of um, autosomes and one pair of X chromosomes where the XY would be the males and the XX would be the females. All right, so the males, they produce half of the Y carrying sperm and half of the X carrying sperm. And of course, all eggs are going to carry that X chromosome. So basically, it's up to the male to determine whether or not there's going to be a female child or a male child. If, you, if the couple are going to have a boy or a girl. That's what it's basically trying to tell you. Not the female. It is up to the male. Based on his chromosomes. Okay. Alright. So here's this. Um, here's what we were, I was referring to back here. With the 22 pairs of autosomes. So here's our 22 pairs of autosomes. This is what it looks like. And then that 23rd one, the very last one, the, and then we have one pair, it'll be an XY, meaning it's a male, or our XX, meaning it will be a female. Don't worry about that right here. That should be XX. But I just wanted to show you guys what it, what they were talk, talking about, the autosomes. These are all autosomes. You have 23 pairs of autosomes. 22. You have, 20, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. 22 of them are considered to be autosomes and one pair of um, that are con or that are con that constitutes that sex chromosomes. Okay. All right. So the sex of a child is determined by the type of chromosome or sorry the type of sperm that fertilizes a a woman's egg. Now an X carrying sperm is going to fertilize the the female. And a Y carrying sperm is going to fertilize the egg, producing a, a, a male child. Now, thus the sex of a child is determined at fertilization by the sperm. Um, now, sex determination does not end with fertilization, but it requires an interaction between the genetics and the homosomes produced by mother and of course by fetus. Now up to a certain point a fetus is sexually undetermined. Uh, undetermined. Now its, its gonoids begin to develop at about five to six weeks as um, gonoidal regions and they're usually laying as, uh, alongside a primitive kidney which later um, degenerates. Now, absent to each of the gonoid ridges are two ducts, the um, uh, the meso meso nephric nephric here it is the meso nephric and the um, the paramezo nephric. Now, in males, the meso nephric ducts they develop into the reproductive tract, and the paramezo nephric ducts they start to degenerate and in females the opposite occurs 
it produces into the, the reproductive tract. All right, so the Y chromosome has a gene called the SRY, and that codes for a protein called the um, testes determinant factor, the TDF, which interacts with genes on other chromosomes. Now, by about eight to nine weeks, the male gonadal ridge has become a um, a type of testes that that begins to secrete hormones or secrete testosterone. This is by eight to ten, eight to nine weeks. Now the testosterone it starts to stimulate this, uh, the mesonephric duct to develop into the system of a male reproductive ducts. Now by this time the testes also secretes a hormone, the MIF factor, which um, causes atrophy of the paramesonephric nephric ducts. Now an adult, uh, a male adult, he retains a, a tiny V-shaped um, vestige of the par of the paramesonephric ducts in the area of the prostatic, um, prosthetic um, uh, urethra, sorry. So the level of estrogen Estrogen is always high during pregnancy. Um, the development of a female therefore results from the absence of an android of, of androgens, not the absence of estrogen. So here are your um, here's this development of of these various structures that we were referring to. In this particular structure, or this particular diagram here, this is five to, to six weeks of an embryo. You cannot determine if, it, if you're going to have a male or female at this particular time. We have the mesonephrons, here is a mesonephric duct, and our paramesonephric duct. Now, when we get to seven to eight weeks in a male child, here we have. Um, your determination of whether or not you're going to have a male, well, everything starts starts to change for the male at that point in time. Let's see where it is. Okay, so here we have this is the 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 um, mesonephric duct's hair. You see, at the seven to eight weeks it starts to form um, into the reproductive tract for the males but you see right here where is the the para the para uh, mesonephric duct they start to disintegrate they start, it starts to disappear hence at birth you have the forming the the full formation of um, the mesonephric ducts also called the ductus deferens okay um, Forming our testes, um, as well as we have the urethra, the penis, and everything has been formed at birth. Okay, but then in females, at the eight to nine weeks, um, the opposite one, the opposite occurs. The paramesonephric ducts remain, and they're what they're the ones that's going to form the um the reproductive tract and the mesonephric disappears keep disappearing here in that diagram but at birth you see that the the paramesonephric has fully formed into the into the uterine tube we have our ovaries on either side and we have the uterus so that's the difference between the male and the female so make sure you understand or know when it occurs, when this change or the determination of a male or female occurs, as well as what's disappearing and what is remaining, you will have that definitely will be on your test. All right, so let's look at development of the external genitalia. The external genitalia begins to develop from 
individual structures in both sexes. By six weeks, the embryo has the following structures. It will have a um, genital, geni a genital um, tubercle, which is an anterior bud that descends to becoming um, the head of the penis or the clitoris. The third, the second is the urogenitalia. Um, it, you have a pair of those that folds, um, that folds, and encloses the the male urethra, helping to form the penis or forms the the labia um, minora. And the last one is the labiosacral folds, and it's a large pair of tissue folds lateral to the um, to the um, the urogenitalia folds. Basically, they're going to form the um, the scrotum for the males and the labia um, uh, majoria. Now, by the, the end of week nine, the fetus begins to show sexual differentiation, and either male or female genitalia are distinctly formed by the end of week twelve. Now, in females, the three structures. Um, become the clitoris glands, the labia um, minora, as well as the labia uh, majora. Now, in the males, that the genitalia tubercle, tubercle it elongates to form the um, the phallus, the urogenital folds. They start to fuse, and they're going to enclose the urethra, beginning in the phallus, and that's going to form the penis. And the labial sacral folds they fuse to form the the sacrum. So here we have it here in this particular diagram. Here we have um, our week six and week eight. Now in the males, around week around week ten, we have the anus that is formed here. We have the um, development of these glands to help form the penis, correct? Also called the, the phallus. So the, the genital tubercles, they, they're going to elongate and they're going to help form, so my mouse can work, they're going to help form the penis by week 12. Now the ero, uh, genital folds, they fuse to form the urethra. And um, they will join the phallus to form, help with forming the penis. Okay, so these are the folds. These are the grooves here. Now the um, the labial sacrifolds they're used to form the um, the scrotum. So here are these folds here. The labial sacrifolds they help form the scrotum by week twelve. And in the females, what do we have here? similar. Now those three f structures that we talked about earlier, which are right here, the genitalia tubercle, the urogenital fold, and the labial sacral fold, they're going to form the clitoris. Here's it developing here. It's going to form the clitoris, the labial um, minora, and then the labia majora. So make sure you know what's going to be formed by week 12 and by what. We know that these three are going to form the three major structures, the clitoris, the, the minor, and the major labia in the females. And make sure you understand what's going to be formed from these three structures here while, um, by week 12 for males. All right, so now both the male and female, the gonads, they initially develop near the kidneys, and then they start to descend. They sort of drop into that pelvic cavity, um, for the ovaries as well. I mean, for, into the pelvic cavity or into the scrotum. So the pelvic cavity, the ovaries will drop into that area, and the testes will, will drop into the scrotum region. Now, in the embryo, a connective 
cord, a connective tissue cord called the um the gobionaculum. The gobionaculum right here. And that extends from the gonoids to the floor of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now in males, what's gonna happen? This gonio the the gobu the the gob um binaculum, sorry, the gobinaculum, it continues to grow and then it's gonna pass between here we see it here, it's gonna pass between the internal and the external abdominal oblique muscles and then into this type of swelling, the sacral swelling. Now independently the uh, the peritoneum it also develops a fold that's gonna extend into the scrotum as the uh, the vaginal process right in here now this creates a path through the through the groin called the inguinal canal which is the most common site for herniation in boys as well as in men now the descent of the testes it begins at as early as um, at week six. Now the superior part of the embryonic gonad it um, degenerates and the inferior part migrates downward guided by the um, the gobineculum. So here is our gobineculum, here is our testes and they're actually going to shift downward and this gobineculum is going to guide it in the correct direction that it's supposed to go into. Okay. Now, as they descend, they are accompanied by elongating testicular arteries and veins, as well as lymphatic vessels, nerves, um, um, spermatic ducts, and extensions of the internal abdominal um, oblique muscle. Let's stay over here, sorry. The vaginal process, it becomes separated from the peritoneal cavity to persist as the, um, here, here we go, as the tunica va um, vagina, um, vagina, vaginalis, and that's enfolding the, inf the anterior and the lateral sides of the testes. There you go. Now the mechanism of descent it becomes very obscure. Now there are about three percent of the boys are born born with undescended testes. And that's called cryptotritism. Now in most cases the testes descend within the first year of infancy. But but if they do not the testosterone injection, um, they'll get testosterone injection or surgery to help correct it. Now, uncorrected, um, if, if this condition is uncorrected, it will lead to um, sterility and sometimes testicular cancer. Now, the ovaries descend also, but to a lesser extent. Now, the gobby, the Gobuleculum it extends from the inferior um, pole of the o ovary to the labial sacral fold. Now the ovaries they they initially lodge just inferior to the brim of the lesser pelvis, and the gobuleculum it becomes a pair of ligaments that are going to support the ovaries as well as the uterus. Here's another picture here. Um, looking at the descent of the testes if you needed it all right so for the male reproductive anatomy now the scrotum now the scrotum and the penis they start to um they constitute the external genitalia of the male and they occupy the um perineum and um it's a diamond shaped area behind the thighs bordered by the pubic symphysis 
some physes, some physes, um, as well as the ischial tuberosities and the coccyx. Now the scrotum, this is what we're looking at here, the scrotum um, is like a pouch of skin, it's like a little pendulum of skin, skin, sorry muscle and of course fibrous connective tissues and they contain the testes here we go they contain the testes so here's our scrotum and it holds the testes now the skin of the scrotum now it has um deciduous glands it has spare hair sp um, sparse hair and uh rinse sense sensory innovation and sometimes a darker pigmentation all right so I'm gonna move on to a different slide so you can actually see where what else I'm gonna talk about here it is so here we have the scrotum okay now it's divided into a left to a left and right compartments by this internal medium septum Okay. Now this protects each testy from infections involving the other side. So if there's an infection on the left side. This separation helps prevent the right side from also um, being infected as well. Now the location of the septum is external. Is is has an external marking by the um, perineal um, raphe, which extends anteriorly along the ventral side of the penis and then posteriorly um, as part of the margin of the anus to see it going down here now the left testy testis sorry is usually um, is usually lower than the right so that the two are not compressed against each other between the thighs so this one is a lot lower than the right side, the left side. Now, posteriorly, the scrotum contains the the um the spermatic cord as well as the bundle of fibrous connective tissue containing the the ductus deferens, um, blood and lymphatic vessels as well as testicular veins. So it holds a number of things. The first one I'm going to repeat it again. It holds the bundle of fibrous connective tissues that are going to contain the ductus fibrins. It also, number two, the spermatic cord. Number three, blood and lymphatic vessels. And number four, um, testicular nerves. So that's four things that the, um, that the scrotum contains posteriorly. Okay, so I jumped ahead a few slides. So you can see um, the spermatic cord. And this spermatic cord, you see right here, this spermatic cord is going to pass upward behind and, of course, superior to the testes. It's going to continue along the anterior side of the pubis. And then into a, uh, a four centimeter long inguinal canal. Okay, and this is going to enter into or merge into the pelvic cavity. Now, the inferior surface in the inguinal canal is the external inguinal ring, and it is its superior exit into that um, pelvic cavity. No, sorry, let me try that again. The inferior entrance to the inguinal cavity is the external inguinal ring, but the ex the superior exit into the pelvic cavity is called the internal inguinal ring. Now the testes, it can't produce um, sperm at a core temperature between 37 degrees Celsius, but it must be held at about 35 degrees Celsius. Now the scrotum has three mechanism mechanisms to regulate its temperature. This muscle right here called the uh, cremaster mu um, uh, muscle. You see that it has stripes of the abdominal or just like the abdominal oblique. And this muscle is going to contract and it's going to draw the testes closer to the body. 
when it is cold. And then, of course, when it, the, the temperature gets warmer, this cremaster muscle, it relaxes and then is able to lower the testes further down, um, further from the body. So it's going to allow it to drop, okay? See how the, the muscle is here, but then it, it extends and it wraps around um, or encloses the, the, um, the, the testes. So see in this, on the right side, they have it actually cut open, but this is it running along the outside. And it wraps around. Okay. And there it is again, enclosed. And this is the enclosed um, testy by the, the cremaster. Okay, second we have the, the dortus the, the dartus muscle. Of course, this is in line with um here it is right here on either side. It's it is um, a subcutaneous layer of smooth muscle and also contracts when it is cold. And then the scrotum and the scrotum becomes a little taut and wrinkled, helping it to hold the testes against the warm body. Then this um, the third one it will be the will be right here, the pampiniform, the pampiniform plexus, right? This area right here, an extension of network of veins um, from the testes that are going to surround the testicular artery in the um, spermatic cord. Now it cools the warm um, articular blood by countercurrent counter -current, um, heat exchange. Lowering the temperature of the arterial blood by 1.5 degrees to 2.5 degrees Celsius. Okay. So, what are the three mechanisms to help in regulating the temperature? We have the two muscles. We have the, the dartus muscle that helps it um, also um, raising the, the testes upward when it's cold as well it'll give it that wrinkly look. We have the cremaster that actually moves the testes upward and downward if it's cold or, or warm respectively. And then we have this plexus. It helps cool the warm um, arterial blood. So those are the three mechanisms. Make sure you pay attention to those three mechanisms. Alright, so when we look at the testes. Testes are, com are combined endocrine and exocrine glands that are going to produce sex hormones and as well as sperm. Now each testy is oval and is slightly flattened. Um, they're about four centimeters long and about six centimeters from anterior to posterior and 2.5 centimeters wide. Um, its anterior and lateral surfaces are covered with tunica um, vagin vaginalitis, no, not vaginitis, sorry, that's inflammation, um, vaginalis, and the testes has a white fibrous capsule called the tunica um, albulgina. Let me see if I can, I think it's on this picture here. Alright, here is our um, vaginalis. The other one is not here. Let's see if I can find a picture. Okay. Now the connective tissue septa that divides the, the testes into 250 to 300 wedge tubules, each of which contains one to three uh, semi semi uh, seminiferous tubules, which are ducts up to seven. Uh, 70 centimeters long that are going to produce the sperm. Now between the seminiferous tub tubules are clusters of interstitial cells and those are the source of the testosterone. Alright, so the seminiferous tub tubule, it has a narrow lumen that's lined by thick uh, germinal epithelium. And this epithelium it consists of several layers of germ cells in the process of becoming sperm. 
and a smaller number of tall uh, nurse cells that produce sorry that protect the germ cells and promote their development so nurse cells are Sertoli cells okay those are ones that are going to protect um, the germ cells as well as um, promote develop the development of them now the germ cells um, they rely on sustenticular cells for, for waste removal uh, growth factors as well as for nutrients and the sustenticular or the Sertoli, Sertoli cells um, they're there to secrete the androgen binding protein and inhibitin I'm sorry inhibitin both of which are going to regulate the production of the sperm okay so um when we look at the BTB which is the blood testes barrier now that is formed by these tight junctions between the um the cystics what did I call them before nurse cells or Sertoli cells those are those tight junctions that, that you'll find between them and they're the ones that are going to prevent antibodies or any large molecules and um, interstitial fluid from getting into these germ cells. Now, this berry is important because the germ cells are genetically are genetically different from other cells. Now, in some cases of sterility, that that um, in some cases sterility is going to occur when the when the BTB fails to form adequately in adolescence. Alright, so we're looking at the um, at the rete um, testes. Now the semi the semiferous tubules they're going to lead into a network of the rete um, testes, and those are embedded in the capsules on the back side, which on the on the posterior side. Now sperm particular partially mature in the in the rete. And then they're moved along by fluid secreted by the, the nurse cells and the cilia um, on some of the rete cells. Now sperm do not swim while in the male, male reproductive tract. Now each testis is supplied by, by a testicular artery that, uh, that um, arise, arises from the, the abdominal artery but below the renal artery. Now this is a very long slender artery that winds its way down the posterior abdominal wall before passing through the inguinal canal into the scrotum. Now its blood pressure is very very low and it is one of few arteries to have no pulse. Now blood flow to the testes is therefore meager and oxygen is in very short supply. Now in response to sperm development usually large mitochondria which can which may help with survival to the hypox no sorry in response to in response to this low blood pressure the poor poor um, O2 supply the sperm develops a, a large amount of mitochondria and they're there to help um, survive in any type of hypoxic female reproductive tract. So they help with um, supplying proper oxygen to the testes um, during intercourse is basically what they're, they're talking about. Now uh, blood leaves the testes by way of the pampiniform plexus of the veins which we've mentioned earlier. Now that merges this which merges as they pass through the inguinal canal to form the testicular vein. Now the right testicular vein is going to drain into the inferior vena cava and the left testicular vein drains into the left renal vein. Now um, lymphatic vessels um, also drain into testes and they travel 
through the sanguinal canal uh, with the veins and leading to the lymph nodes near the near the lower aorta. Now lymph from the penis and the scrotum travels to the lymph nodes adjacent to this iliac arteries and the veins in the inguinal region. The testicular nerves, they lead to the, the gonoids from the spinal cord segments T10 and T11. So that's thoracic 10 and thoracic 11. Now they are mixed sensory and motor nerves and they contain predominantly sympathetic but also some parasympathetic fibers. Now, the sensory fibers are um, are connected primarily with with pain, and the autonomic fibers are predominantly um, vasomotor for regulation of the blood flow. Okay, so let me see, use the diagram to continue what I'm talking about. Um, now, after the, the sperm leaves the leaves the testes, it's going to travel t through the um, through a series of um, spermatic ducts to reach the urethra. Now, about there's about uh, twelve small efferent ductiles that arise from the posterior side. I guess we get this, the posterior side um, of the testes, and they're going to carry sperm to the epididymis. Here's my epididymis. See these, these little, um, here are these small little sperm oil ducts. Okay, so the these, um, these are efferent ductile, sorry. And they're the ones that are going to carry the sperm to the epididymis. So you see you have the head of the epididymis and you have the tail of the epididymis. And they have a cluster of ciliated cells. Now the epididymis is a site of of um, sperm maturity as well as for storage. So after it's produced, it, they're put into the epididymis where they begin to mature and they're stored for until they're they're needed to be used. Now, of course, when you look at the epididymis, it has a glove, another glove. It has a a club-like head, and a medium-sized body, and then it has a very slender tail. And it consists of single cord ducts about six meters long or 18 feet long. And they're embedded in connective tissue. Now this duct is going to reabsorb about 90% of the fluid secreted by the testes. Now sperm takes about 20 days, 20 days to reach the tail of the epididymis where it is stored. Now the sperm remains fertile for about 40 to 60 days and if not ejaculated they disintegrate and are reabsorbed. Okay, so the vastus deferens. The, va the vast deferens or the ductus deferens, this is what we're looking at right here. This is the vast deferens, the ductus deferens. It begins where the the tail of the duct ends, and then it straightens out. It, uh, it straightens out where the duct of the epididymis is straightens out at the tail, and then it makes a 180 degree turn. So here is our ductus deferens. Now it is a muscular tube, and it's about 45 centimeters long and 2.5 millimeters in diameter. And it passes upward through the um, the uh, spermatic cord, sorry, and the inguinal uh, canal into the pelvic cavities. You see it going up in here. Now, after passing between the bladder and the urethra, it turns downward behind the bladder, which we don't see behind the bladder, and then it widens into um, a terminal apula. Now, it unites with the duct of the sem of the seminal um, vesicle, vesicle, sorry. Now the duct has a thick wall of smooth muscle innervated by the sympathetic nerve fibers. Um, so where the ductus uh, deferens and the duct of 
seminal vestae meet, they form a very short um, ejectile duct. This duct passes through the prostate gland and then empties into the urethra. This is the last of the um, spermatic ducts. Now the male urethra is shared by the reproductive and the urinary systems. And it is about 18 centimeters long and it consists of three regions. The prostatic, the membranous, and the spongy urethra. So I'm going to skip ahead to some more of the diagrams so um, what I'm talking about will actually make sense. So I'm going to move forward to slide 47. So everything I'm talking about is here. So you can follow along with your notes, but I'm just going to pay attention to the diagrams so it will make a lot of sense to what I'm talking about. Alright, so here are the, um, the three regions of the male urethra. You have the prosthetic region. You have the membranous, I mean the prosthetic urethra, the membranous urethra, and then we have the spongy or the penile ure, um, urethra. Now the urethra cannot pass through urine and semen, semen, and semen um, simultaneous. It's either one or the other. Okay. Um, so just to backtrack just a little bit about the deferens. All right. So here's our testes. Here, here are the um, the efferent ducts. Remember, there's about 12 of them, and they're going to attach or help with um, directing the the sperm to the epididymis, where where things are stored and matured. They matured and then stored. All right. So then we have the ductus deferens, which I said made that 180 degree turn and all the way into um, um, passing through the, sp um, the spermatic cord and into the inguinal canal and then into that pelvic cavity. Now I also said it's going to pass through the bladder, which we see here. It's going to pass through the bladder and then I see it starts to widen and is forming that um, the terminal ampulla. Okay. Then it's going to unite with a duct of um, seminal um, vessel, which is right here. It's going to unite with it in this particular area, right in here. And then they're going to meet with the um, with the ejaculatory duct, which is right here. So I'll see what else how much makes sense. So let me just show you guys a diagram so everything makes sense. Okay, and then this duct passes where? This, this duct passes through the prostate gland, which you see here, and then it empties into the urethra. And then this is the last of the spermatic ducts. Okay, so let's look at some more things on the particular diagram. You can continue in your notes. But we have um, three sets of accessory glands, and they're formed in the they're found in the male reproductive tract. We have the, the seminal vesicles, which I mentioned earlier. We have the prostate gland. And then we have the bulbo-urethral glands. So let's take a look at the seminal, let's get this working here. The, the seminal vesicle, the, yeah, the seminal vesicles. As you see, there's a pair. There's one on either side um, of, of the posterior portion of or the posterior view of of the bladder and one is associated with each of the duct deferens. So you have one for each of the duct deferens. Okay. Now the seminal vesicle is about five centimeters in length um, with a uh, connected tissue capsule and of course the underlying layer of smooth muscle. Now the secretory the secretory portion is very con um, convoluted. It's a very convoluted duct with numerous branches that empties into the ejaculatory duct, which is right in here. Now the yellow secretion of the seminal vesicles it constitute about 60% of the semen. I hope you guys heard what I just said. The yellowish secretion of the seminal vesicles constitutes about 60% of 
D constitutes about 60%, 60%, sorry about that percent, but 60% of the semen. Now the prostate gland, which we see here on either side, it surrounds the urethra and the ejaculatory ducts immediately are inferior to the to the um to the urinary bladder now it measures approximately two it's a two by four by three centimeters and is an aggregate of thirty to fifty um tubular acular um, acinar, sorry, glands in the tuber in the fibrous capsule. Now this gland it empties through about 20 pores into the into the urethral wall. Now the stroma consists of connective tissue and smooth muscle, like that of the seminal vesicles. Now the prostate secretion it constitutes just 30 percent. So this is the seminal vesicle, and this is our prostate gland. Of course, we're going to have one more. All right, so the very last one, coffer, you might see um, cow, cowfer, cowpers. Here it is, the cowper um, glands or the globulorethral gland. They're named for their portion near the... Um, dilated bulb at the inferior end of the penis and then their association with the urethra so here we have it over here on both sides they're um, brownish in color spherical in shape and about one centimeter in diameter and 2.5 centimeter with a 2.5 centimeter duct into the urethra now during sexual arousal they produce a clear um, slippery fluid that lubricates the head of the penis now the fluid also protects the sperm by neutralizing the acidity of the resi of the residual um, urine in the urethra so remember we said that this is the same canal um, the same urethra that urine and semen pass through so it has to be cleaned from from um from the urine passing through and that's where this particular gland comes into play it's going to make sure it cleans it out it neutralizes it before the semen passes through okay so we're looking at the remaining 10% will come from our our B gland okay so that is the end of our of our lecture for this video so if you have any questions don't forget to post it um, in the next videos we'll look at the different prostate diseases and the other parts of the the remaining parts of the male reproductive system